My dear friends and colleagues, welcome to the 12th Annual Fireside of the J. Reuben Clark Law Society. This fireside is being broadcast from the Conference Center in Salt Lake City, Utah, to attorney and student chapters throughout the world. We are grateful to you for being with us this evening. I am joined on the stand by those who will participate in our program and whom I will introduce shortly. We are privileged to be joined by Elder Dallin H. Oaks and Elder D. Todd Christofferson of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles for the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, along with Elder Christofferson's wife, Kathy. We are so grateful for their kind and unwavering support of the Law Society. With us as well are our local chapter chairs and members of the Law Society's Board of Directors and their guests. Other leaders of academic, church, and legal communities are here with us this evening as well. And although we do not have time to recognize each individually, we acknowledge both their presence and their significant contributions to the Law Society, our communities, and our profession. We express appreciation to the Church's Satellite uh, Committee, Audiovisual Department, and Satellite Broadcast Team for making this evening possible, as well as the Office of General Counsel, especially Elder Lance B. Wickman and Bill Atkin. We also thank the Law Society's Fireside Committee, chaired by Mary Hoagland, the Law Society's new Executive Director, along with Mark Ethington, Craig Carlisle, Scott Richards, Alan Dahl, and Roberta Lauder for planning this evening. Perhaps most importantly, we recognize that so many of you have planned events in your own areas in connection with this broadcast. We are grateful for your efforts and for all that our local chapter leaders and members do to advance the, law, the mission of the Law Society. That mission includes a simple yet powerful principle for enduring fairness and virtue in our legal systems, a truth expressed both succinctly and profoundly by King Benjamin in the Book of Mormon, quote, that when ye are in the service of your fellow beings, ye are only in the service of your God, end quote. Throughout the world, individual members and chapters of the Law Society continue to provide meaningful service in their communities, from West Africa to Washington, D.C., from South America to Australia. The acts of service have been many. Speaking of such service, one of our chapter chairs, Araldo Cavalcante, said, quote, We want to highlight the importance of having a religious belief to truly ingrain ethical values of a profession in law. So, Dealing with pro bono activities, we expect to hold up to three annual events to cement these principles. It is this commitment to religious service and religious conviction that I want to, would like to share with you. This same chapter chair, recognized for his devotion <clears throat> to service and protection of religious freedoms, was recently appointed a member of the Law and Religion Commi Freedom Committee for his local bar association in Brazil. In a similar effort to collaborate in service with other lawyers of faith, just last week, the Phoenix chapter of the Law Society held a Law and Religious Liberty Symposium. There are still many more examples that I could share of such service and collaboration. And what we have done is good, but we can do more. With more than 200 chapters worldwide and well over 10,000 members, we have the ability the training, and the capacity to relieve suffering and to bless lives. To paraphrase another scripture, if we had been and were and ever would be committed to service in all of its forms, lives would forever be changed. We will hear more of what we can do and become in a fortnight as we gather in our annual conference held in Kansas City, Missouri, in the midst of historic Jackson County and surrounding sites. We will be privileged to hear from many wonderful speakers and presenters at that conference. And if you have not already registered, I encourage you to go online and register at jrclsconference.com. We gather this evening not only to recognize significant acts and lives of service, but to listen to words of inspiration as we move forward in this important work. Our program will proceed as follows. Mark Ethington, chair of the Salt Lake City chapter of the Law Society, will offer the invocation after which Liesl Lacates, Adrian Knighting, Andrew Rawlings, and Christopher Buse, students from the S.J. Quinney College of Law at the University of Utah, will perform the song, In Christ Alone. Following the musical number, the Franklin S. Richards Award for Service will be presented to Scott Cameron. 
It is only fitting that on the night we should give this award to our friend and consummate service that he and his wife, Christine, are serving. They are now the directors of the Visitor Center at the Mesa, Arizona Temple. Steve West, the chair of our outreach, service and outreach committee, will introduce and present the award to Scott both virtually tonight and in person later this week. We will then be privileged to hear some remarks from uh, Scott Cameron, now Elder Cameron, following those, <clears throat> following those remarks. Dean Jim Rasband, Dean of the Brigham Young University School of Law, will present the Dis J. Ruben Clark Law Society Distinguished Service Award to Elder Bruce C. Hafen. Jonathan Hafen, longtime member of the Law Society and partner at Parr, Brown, Gee, and Loveless, will introduce his father, Elder Hafen, who is a former college president, law school dean, and temple president, and emeritus member of the First Quorum of the Seventy of the Church. We are honored <clears throat> to have with us Elder Hafen and his wife. Marie tonight and look forward to hearing from him. After Elder Hafen speaks, Honda Vieira, the chair of the Law Society's student chapter board and a third-year law student, will give the benediction. Mark. Our kind and most gracious Heavenly Father, we are very grateful unto thee for this beautiful evening and for the opportunity that we have to be here together as friends and members of the J. Reuben Clark Law Society. We pray, Father, that, thy, that Thou wilt pour out Thy Spirit upon us and upon all those who are participating around the world. We pray, Father, that we will be enlightened and enthused about those principles which we learned this evening. We are very grateful for Elder Hafen and for his life of service to thee and to the, to the BYU Law School. We pray that thy spirit will be with him this evening and comfort and strengthen him as he delivers his remarks to us. Father, we pray that thou wilt soften the hearts of legislative, executive, and judicial servants throughout the world that they will enact, enforce, and interpret just and fair laws that are consistent with thy teachings. Father, we're grateful for the J. Reuben Clark Law Society, for the opportunity that it affords to us to serve in our communities and to help strengthen our commitment to have our faith in thee influence our profession. We are grateful for our professional careers we pray, Father, that Thou wilt bless each of us, that we will do well therein, so that we may do much good for those whom we serve. We are most grateful, Father, for our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, and for His atoning sacrifice. We pray that we will always remember Him and strive to be like Him. And this we, we say now humbly, in the name of Jesus Christ, amen.
light of the world by darkness slain. Then bursting forth in glorious day, up from the grave he rose again. And as he stands in victory, with the precious blood of Christ. No guilt in life, no fear in death. This is the power of Christ in me. From life's first cry to final breath, Jesus commands destiny, no power of hell, no scheme of man, can ever pluck me from his hand, for I am his, and he is mine. I bring you greetings from sunny Arizona, where this year's recipient of the Franklin S. Richards Public Service Award has just begun his service, along with his wife Christine, as director of the Mesa Temple, Arizona Temple Visitor Center. For many members of the Law Society, Scott Cameron needs no introduction. A true pioneer, Scott was at ground level when the Society was formed, and his intellect Humility and warmth have helped guide and shape the Law Society ever since. His life reflects the virtues embodied in our mission statement, religious conviction, service to fellow man, and commitment to professional excellence. Under Scott's steady guidance, Law Society chapters have been organized all over the world with service as a founding principle. Leaders have been trained, friendships have been formed, and lives have been changed. All who have known and worked with him over these many years have been blessed by his kindness, his friendship, and his example of selflessness. Though he is always modest, service is at the core of his character. It is fitting that following the Law Society's celebration of its 25th year, we pause to recognize Scott's tireless efforts to build an organization whose potential for good in the world is limitless. On behalf of the grateful members of the J. Ruben Clark Law Society the world over, I am honored to present this year's Franklin S. Richards Public Service Award to Scott W. Cameron. Greetings from the Mesa, Arizona Temple Visitor Center. My wife Chris and I have just started our service at the center but we're thrilled that we have the opportunity to hear from Elder Hafen this evening, and we'll be um, joining the Phoenix chapter of the Law Society to watch this broadcast. I would like to thank the Law Society for this wonderful honor. I sincerely hope that no one thinks I was on the selection committee for the award this year. In 1988, the J. Room Clark Law Society was established on three pillars, religious conviction, professional excellence, and service. 
It has been my privilege to encourage over the last 25 years members of the society to support these three pillars. Over 20 years ago, under the able direction of Ralph Maybe, then chair of the Law Society, Bill Atkin, Ralph, and I hammered out our current mission statement. We affirm the strength brought to the law by a lawyer's personal religious conviction. We strive through public service and professional excellence to promote fairness and virtue founded upon the rule of, the law, of law. Some years ago, the Franklin S. Richards Award was established to champion increased service. I certainly congratulate those capable people who have provided service and have been given this award, award in the past. It has been successful. I acknowledge that for 25 years I have encouraged service, but I've mo mostly been on the sidelines uh, rather than in the actual service. I take comfort in knowing that we do have a, a theological position that we will be judged for the intents of our hearts in addition to our actions. I gladly accept this award for myself and for each member of the society who, like me, has intentions to serve. Wouldn't it be wonderful if in the year 2014 we all did more in terms of providing service to our fellow man and abiding by the great commandment in the law to love God with all our heart, mind, might, and strength and to love our neighbor as ourselves. Chris and I um, pledge ourselves in 2014 as we serve in the Mesa, Arizona Temple Visitor Center to provide even great a greater service. We hope you will join with us and make your intentions reality so that at the end of the year, the J. Reuben Clark Law Society will be known for its fruits and not just its good intentions. Thank you. Well, how wonderful to see Scott and Chris on, on camera. Good evening. It's really great to be with you. And, and let me first just congratulate my colleague, Scott Cameron. I'm glad we were able to recognize his long and dedicated service to the Law Society, as well as his love for this organization and its members. Scott's really been at the core of all the service efforts of the Law Society and is well deserving of the Franklin S. Richards Award. I'm delighted and proud to be here tonight. Um, this fireside and the annual conference that will take place in Kansas City in a couple of weeks are powerful examples of the growth and influence of a law society which began many years ago at BYU Law School and which now enjoys such broad international influence. It's my pleasure this evening to present the most prestigious award given by the J. Reuben Clark Law Society, the Distinguished Service Award to Elder Bruce C. Hafen. The fact that Elder Hafen, along with Elder Ralph Hardy, was the creator and founder of the Law Society would be enough alone to merit his receiving this award. All of us in this room owe him a debt of gratitude for making possible the relationships we've enjoyed through our participation in the Law Society. But of course, founding the Law Society during his time as dean at BYU Law School doesn't come close to describing Elder Hafen's contributions to the church, to church education, to legal scholarship, and to so many of us who've always looked forward to his talks, articles, and books. In fact, I look forward to learning from him again tonight. As we present this award, I also want to recognize the contributions of Sister Marie Hafen. Years of distinguished service don't happen without real sacrifices of a supportive spouse, and in this case, someone who is a writer and teacher in her own right. We recognize that you are closely yoked in all of your service and accomplishments, and thank you for it. It's truly an honor for me to present this award to someone I've admired and looked up to throughout my life. Nevertheless, I'll keep my thoughts brief because Elder Hafen's son, John, who is one of our distinguished graduates, will have the opportunity to introduce him more fully in just a minute. I'll just say that when I think of a distinguished service award, I can't imagine someone who better epitomizes the idea of a consecrated servant. Elder Hafen has spent a life following the path of duty and service rather than the path of professional fulfillment and personal comfort. Those of you who know Elder Hafen will know that his lifelong ambition was to be a scholar and teacher, but his professional aspirations were overtaken by callings and assignments, 
At age 37, he was asked to be president of then Ricks College. Following that assignment, he returned to BYU, where he was asked to serve as dean of the law school. Before that assignment could conclude, Rex Lee asked him to serve as provost of Brigham Young University. I think very few um, can appreciate the personal sacrifices that he made in the role of provost um, as he took on one hard task after another at the university. And then after his university service, he was called to the first quorum of the 70, where he served faithfully until three years ago when he was made emeritus and promptly began um, three more years of service at the, as the temple president in St. George. The trajectory of his life and service um, reminds me of a favorite and familiar Christmas movie, um, Frank Capra's It's a Wonderful Life. Like Jimmy Stewart's George Bailey, um, Elder Hafen's willingness to serve and give up some of his early dreams has blessed all of us. And the result has been, in my view, a wonderful life indeed. And so on behalf of more than 12,300 attorney and student members of the J. Urban Clark Law Society, I am honored tonight to present the Distinguished Service Award to Elder Bruce C. Hafen. For part of the time that I attended BYU Law School, my dad was the dean. Sometimes that created some uncomfortable situations. Let me give you an example. My first day in one of my classes, professor looked down at me and said, Hafen, huh? You must be the dean's son. Well, I said, yes, yes I am. And then here's what he said. Well, here's what happened the last time we had a student whose father was a professor. You know, student, students use numbers on their exams instead of names. But when the professor sat down to read the exams, every one of them started the same way. Dear Dad. <laughs> it's an honor for me to introduce my dear dad to you tonight. Elder Bruce C. Hafen was born in St. George, Utah in 1940. He graduated from Dixie College and served in the West German Mission. After his mission, he attended BYU, where he took a class called Your Religious Problems. In that class, he met Marie Karchner Hafen, his future wife and my mom, thus solving his primary religious problem. In October 1964, his father, Orville Hafen, also an attorney, died unexpectedly while working in a canyon that we now call Tuacon, down by St. George. My dad had been planning to go out and get a PhD and teach, like Dean Rasband mentioned. But his father's untimely death changed all of those plans. In his words, Marie and I came home from my dad's funeral feeling unsettled enough about graduate school that we fasted and prayed for help. We abruptly decided to enroll in law school at the University of Utah, even though I hadn't completed my undergraduate degree, I hadn't taken the LSAT, and the U's law school was already three weeks into its 12-week first quarter. Marie was working on her master's degree in English. She was expecting our first baby, who turned out to be a great kid, by the way. <laughs> And I was in a BYU bishopric, so I commuted daily to Salt Lake City. I don't recommend these as ideal conditions for starting law school. Despite this unorthodox beginning, Elder Hafen quickly learned to love studying law. After graduating from law school and practicing in Salt Lake City with a prominent firm for four years, he became an assistant to Dallin Oaks, the new BYU president. In that role, Elder Hafen was heavily involved in the founding of the J. Reuben Clark Law School at BYU. Now, here's how I know that. This was kind of a long time ago. My dad got this really cool shovel at the groundbreaking. It was gold. It said May 1, 1973, groundbreaking. And I remember that shovel so well because it was great at digging up big rocks in the backyard. Eventually, Elder Hafen became a member of BYU's law school faculty. 
But his time as a full-time professor was short-lived. In 1976, Elder Neil Maxwell asked him to help create what is now called the Church's Research Information Division. Two years later, as again, as Dean Rasband mentioned, at the ripe old age of 37, he became president of Ricks College, now called BYU-Idaho. I still remember overhearing somebody say, when I first got up to Rexburg, I can't believe they made a kid the president of our college. During his years at Ricks, in addition to running that wonderful college, he found time, usually in the summer, to continue his legal research and writing. One of these efforts was a 1979 BYU devotional entitled on dealing with uncertainty. That article changed my life and my direction. And for all of you law students in particular that are with us tonight, I highly recommend that you read it on dealing with uncertainty. Just run a Google search, Hafen, uncertainty, there you go. Elder Hafen became the dean of BYU Law School in 1985, and during that time he helped to establish the J. Reuben Clark Law Society, and I know how proud he is of being a part of this wonderful worldwide organization. My dad is an internationally recognized scholar in family law and constitutional law even today. His professional articles have appeared in journals such as the Michigan Law Review and the Harvard Law Review. His work has been cited on multiple occasions by the United States Supreme Court, and you can find it in law school textbooks. He became the provost of BYU in 1989, and then in 1996, he received a calling by President Gordon B. Hinckley to serve in the first quorum of 70. During his years as a general authority, about 15 years, he served in area presidencies in Australia, in North America, and in Europe. He was also an advisor to the Church Historical Department, to the Temple Department, and the Priesthood Department. After becoming an Emeritus General Authority in 2010, he, he and my mom were given a wonderful and sacred opportunity to serve. They served as three, for three years as the President and Matron of the St. George Temple, which was truly a sacred experience for them. He was able to, in some ways, go home again. Because my mom will assist my dad a bit with his talk tonight, let me just mention a couple of words about her. In addition to being a full-time mother of seven children and a grandmother of a, what is now a very large clan, my mom is a teacher at heart, just like Dean Rasband mentioned. She taught Shakespeare, she taught Book of Mormon at BYU and also up at Ricks, but she also did many other things. She served as a member of the Deseret News Board of Directors. She served on the Gen Young Women's General Board as well. She and my dad loved working closely together in the spiritual atmosphere of the temple, where they developed, it was just so obvious, I loved seeing it, they developed a deep appreciation for the doctrinal foundations of temple work. And I'm really looking forward to hearing from them tonight, because tonight you will see how my father's life as a family law scholar and their time as the president and matron of the St. George Temple have shaped them. Please join me now in welcoming my dear dad, Elder Bruce C. Hafen. John, your mom and I appreciate and admire the kind of person that you have become and the kind of lawyer you are. You represent what this law society is about. Brothers and sisters of the law society all over the world, I am deeply honored to be with you here tonight. I understand that the law society now has over 10,000 members in more than 100 chapters plus 135 student chapters, and a third of those chapters are now outside the United States. As I think of the international dimension, I'm thinking of a young man who came to the St. George Temple recently. He was on his way to Argentina on a mission. Just greeting him as he came to the temple, I chatted a minute. I said, well, do you speak any Spanish yet? And he said with utmost sincerity, I only know one word of Spanish, aloha. <laughs> uh, I tried to remain reverent in the temple. Uh, aloha isn't a Spanish word, but it works tonight. 
because it somehow says hello and welcome in most any tongue. You know, the J. Reuben Clark Law Society didn't exist when I became the dean of the law school in 1985. Having graduated its first class in 1976, the law school was still too new to have senior alumni to mentor our students and our graduates. I expressed concern about that problem one day to Ralph Hardy, a seasoned partner in a fine Washington, D.C. law firm. Although Ralph had never attended BYU, he said to me, because of BYU's visibility and my membership in the Church, the attitudes of my law partners tell me that my professional reputation is linked to the reputation of that law school. How can I help you? As we discussed what experienced lawyers can do for young practitioners, Ralph told me his own story. He said when he first came to D.C. from Berkeley in law, for law school, he was overwhelmed by his inability to balance all the demands of his law practice, his family, and his Church commitments. Then he began to notice his stake president, a lawyer named Robert W. Barker, who did all of those things superbly well. And Ralph said to himself, if Bob Barker can do that, maybe I can too. So Robert Barker became Ralph Hardy's mentor, and the inspiration Ralph had drawn from that relationship inspired his next idea to me. He said, why don't we organize a society of LDS lawyers and their friends? That would give many young LDS lawyers a Bob Barker in their own community. Ralph's high ideals and creative energy were contagious as we talked. Ideas exploded between us like popcorn in a microwave. What about a professional directory? Maybe we could organize more than one chapter. Uh, and why not name the society? for J. Reuben Clark, who personified the spiritual and professional qualities we would want to foster in both the Law Society and the Law School. Well, that really was the founding moment for this Law Society, and I am really grateful to Ralph Hardy and many others like him who sifted these ideas and find the ones that, to find the ones that worked, and then over the next 20 years they created the bonds of mutual respect and support that draw us together tonight. I have two related purposes on my mind tonight. First, I'd like to tell you how I got into the once boring but now almost too dramatic field of family law and what I found there. In this first part, I'll be talking as one lawyer to another, but I hope my footnotes will suggest some more general perspectives. And then second, against that background, I'd like to talk about marriage including our own marriages and marriage as taught in the temple. In doing that, I realize that many devoted people are not now in the kind of family situation they either desire or deserve. Of course, Church doctrine encourages marriage. It discourages divorce. But marrying isn't always under our control, and there are times when divorce is the better choice. Our leaders have taught that despite divorce or being single, no eternal blessing, even celestial glory, will be denied those who are true and faithful. Well, let me go back to the early days of the law school's history for the key conversation that launched me into family law. I was talking to Rex Lee, who was writing something and wanted me to look through it, as he was then the founding dean of the law school, and uh, he was would later become the Solicitor General of the United States. He would also become later the President of BYU. But for Rex Lee, university administration would never be as interesting as constitutional law. Well, as Rex and I talked, we thought back over recent constitutional developments at that time. We both cheered that the powerful idea of individual rights had energized the civil rights movement, which was helping the U.S. overcome its embarrassing history of racial discrimination. We also applauded how those same ideas had begun to help the country eradicate discrimination against women. At one point as we talked, I said to Rex just a spontaneous question. Rex, do you think the idea of individual rights, which has such a head of steam, will ever develop so much momentum that it will overpower the principles that ought to be balanced against individualism? Rex's brow furrowed a little. What do you mean, he said. Give me an example. So just spontaneously, I said, well, what about children? The law discriminates against children on the basis of age. They can't vote, can't drive a car, can't sign a binding contract. 
But is that discrimination bad for children or is it good for them? That got me to thinking. I wondered if a children's rights movement would follow the civil rights and women's movement. Spurred by that question, I did some research. And I found that a sometimes reckless children's rights movement was indeed underway, illustrated back then by a state court decision that, in effect, let a teenager essentially divorce her parents. I soon found other examples of excessive individualism. For instance, one law professor argued for a constitutional right of intimate association, urging that the law give the same legal rights to people in any intimate relationship as it then gave to relationships based on marriage and kinship. Some scholars also attacked marriage as a source of oppression against women. Advocates of sexual privacy argued that unmarried cohabitation should be constitutionally equated with marriage. Allowing me to respond to such issues, in 1983, the Michigan Law Review published my article, The Constitutional Status of Marriage, Kinship, and Sexual Privacy, Balancing the Individual and Social Interests. Note some terms from that title, social interests and individual interests. I ran across these terms in what has been called the best-known essay in the history of family law, written by Harvard Law School Dean Roscoe Pound. Pound defined the social interests in family law as society's interest in maintaining marriage as a stable social institution in which parents nurture and teach their children the qualities of character that maintain a stable future society. He distinguished this social interest from what he called the individual interests in domestic relations, noting that, quote, when the legal system recognizes certain individual rights, it does so because society as a whole will benefit thereby, close quote. And then in a key insight, Pound warned that lawyers and judges must compare the individual and social interests, quote, on the same analytical plane lest the very decision to categorize one claim as individual and the other as social cause us to decide the question in advance in our very way of putting it." Close quote. Well, during the last half century, U.S. courts and legislatures have increasingly neglected what had been obvious to Roscoe Pound about the social interests in marriage and parenting. Primarily through the use of constitutional law categories, many courts and legal scholars came to assume that individual interests were somehow more fundamental or compelling than social interests. As a result, just as Pound had feared, our system has decided many difficult issues of family policy in advance simply by the way we put the question. Individual interests have thus been carried on such a tidal wave of constitutional law that the contemporary mind now sees hardly any social interests in our legal and cultural understanding of marriage and parenting. I know that's a fairly bold statement. Let me try to illustrate just one little example. One researcher found that the Supreme Court's cases about marriage prior to about 1970, quote, turned on the importance of marriage to society, but its later cases began to turn on the importance of the relationship to the individual, close quote. And we may never know how much of this change was the result of truly serious policy analysis and how much of it was because constitutional law simply began to preempt family law. Now, it's often hard to tell when the law causes social change and when the law simply reflects social change. I understand that. One obvious but huge historical factor in all of this is that since the 1960s, our culture has experienced colossal changes in attitudes and values that affect family life. Indeed, Harvard's Mary Ann Glendon calls this development, quote, the transformation of, fam of American family law, close quote the biggest cultural shift in attitudes about family life in 500 years. To illustrate further, I'll just touch a few headlines from a, an altitude of about 40,000 feet without trying to draw the fine distinctions we would identify closer to the ground. 
Also, I'll be speaking mostly about U.S. law, but the laws of most developed countries have followed these same trends. In a nutshell, advocates began using the constitutionally charged language of individual rights to challenge laws that were intended to support the interests of children and society in stable family structures. Courts began to accept these arguments despite the fact that the individual rights protections in the U.S. Constitution were originally enacted to protect individuals from the state, not to protect them from people who are not state actors, such as those in their own families. For instance, the courts expanded the parental rights of unwed fathers and gave child custody and adoption rights to unmarried individuals. This uprooted the long-established preference that family law had given whenever possible to the formal two-parent biological family. Both experience and the social science research clearly show and still show that a home led by married biological parents almost always provides the best child-rearing environment. But over time, the unwed parent cases both contributed to and were influenced by skyrocketing rates of unwed births and unmarried cohabitation. Further, in Roe v. Wade in 1973, the Supreme Court granted individual women the right to choose an abortion, thereby rejecting long-held beliefs in our culture not only about the social interests held by unborn children, but also about the social purposes served by allowing elected legislators to decide collectively about a question as value-laden and sensitive as when does life begin. Also, no-fault divorce was first adopted in California in 1968 and gradually became the law in every state. No-fault significantly changed how people thought about marriage. Under the old divorce laws, Married people couldn't just choose to end their marriage. They had to prove spousal misconduct, and lawyers helped them make that case in court, like showing adultery or mental cruelty, and only a judge could determine whether a divorce was justified because he or she represented the state's social interest in the marriage. Now, no-fault divorce started off with worthy goals. It really did. It, it, it added irretrievable marriage breakdown, regardless of fault, as an additional basis for divorce. And that simplified divorce actions, and it reduced messy litigation. And in theory, only a judge could decide whether a marriage was indeed beyond repair. But in practice, family court judges simply deferred to the couple and eventually deferred to the partner who wanted the divorce. And so rather than seeing marriage as a social institution, no fault came to see marriage as an essentially private relationship between adults, terminable at the will of either, without regard to the consequences for children, let alone the effect of divorce on society. And then, before long, judges' doubts about society's right to enforce wedding vows gave married couples the false impression that their personal promises to each other held no great social or moral value. As these new legal assumptions then blended with larger cultural swings, most Americans now no longer see marriage as a relatively permanent social institution. Rather, they see it as a temporary, private source of personal fulfillment. And so, when marriage commitments intrude on personal preferences, people are more likely to just walk away. So today is the age of what somebody called the non-binding commitment, whatever that oxymoron means. Now, talking about no-fault divorce actually leads logically to a, just a brief comment on gay marriage. Now is not the time for extended discussion of this very difficult and poignant topic. But I do know that only 15 years ago, no country in the world had legally recognized same-gender marriage. So how could the very idea of gay marriage burst upon the international scene when, ironically, the historic concept of marriage had just lost so much public value? Well, the personal autonomy theory 
articulated in the first U.S. pro-gay marriage case in 2001 simply extended the same individualistic legal concept that had created no-fault divorce. Let me try to summarize the connection this way. When a court upholds an individual's right to end a marriage, regardless of social consequences, as can happen with no-fault divorce, that same principle may also seem to support an individual's right to start a marriage, regardless of social consequences, as can happen with same-gender marriage. In other words, if man-woman marriage is no longer a big deal for society but just a matter of individual preference, it's really little wonder that many people would now say of gay marriage, it's no big deal. Let people do whatever they want to. That's what can happen when we lose track of society's interest in marriage and children. We know that God loves all of His children and that we must treat one another with compassion and tolerance, regardless of private conduct that we may or may not understand. But it's a very different matter to endorse or promote that conduct by allowing the appropriation of a legal concept, marriage, whose primary and historic purpose is to further social interests. Consider briefly the stunning effect of these changes on marriage and children during the last 50 years. Just a few highlights. In the U.S., the divorce rate has more than doubled, although it has dipped slightly in recent years. Today, about half of all first marriages end in divorce. About 60 percent of second marriages do. The U.S. is the world's most divorce-prone country. Today, over 40 percent of U.S. births are to unmarried parents. In 1960, that number was about 5 percent. As Elder Dallin H. Oaks noted recently in General Conference, 50 percent of today's teens consider out-of-wedlock childbearing a worthwhile lifestyle. The percentage of children in single-parent families has increased threefold, from 9 percent to 26 percent. The number of unmarried couples has increased by about 15 times, and over half of today's marriages are preceded by unmarried cohabitation. What was abnormal 50 years ago is the new normal. In Scandinavia, 82 percent of firstborn children are born outside marriage. When Marie and I were living in Germany recently, we sensed among Europeans that in many ways, it seems, marriage is no more. Marriage is gone away. As a French writer put it, marriage has, quote, lost its magic for young people who increasingly feel that love is essentially a private matter which leaves no room for the larger society to say anything about their marriage or their children. Close quote. Nonetheless, the children of divorced or unwed parents have about three times as many serious behavioral, emotional, and developmental problems as children in two parent families. By every measure of child well being, these children are far worse off, and when children are dysfunctional, society will become dysfunctional. Some examples. Since about 1960 in the U.S., juvenile crime and child abuse have quintupled. Psychological disorders among children have all worsened, from drug abuse to eating disorders. Depression among children has increased a thousand percent. Domestic violence against women has increased, and poverty has shifted increasingly to children. I was reassured reading the New York Times earlier this week, these are not old statistics. About four days ago, the New York Times reported a major new study which found that the children of single parents have strikingly less upward economic mobility than other children have. Economic inequality is a big issue in this country, and that's the key variable from this major study. What does it say about these last 50 years and family life? How serious are these problems? Not many years ago, President Gordon B. Hinckley said, quote, In my judgment, the greatest challenge facing this nation is the problem of the family, brought on by misguided parents and resulting in misguided children. The family is falling apart, not only in America but now across the world. 
This is a matter of serious concern. I think, he said, this is my most serious concern. Close quote. Shortly after he said these words, the First Presidency and the Twelve gave us the proclamation on the family. For a non-religious viewpoint on this same point, consider this indictment from a recent Time magazine article about infidelity among political leaders. Quote, there is no other single force causing as much measurable hardship and human misery in this country as the collapse of marriage. It hurts children. It reduces mothers' financial security. And it has landed with particular devastation on those who can bear at least the nation's underclass. The poor have uncoupled parenthood from marriage and the financially secure blast apart their own unions if they aren't having fun anymore." Close quote. I know that these complex problems didn't result solely from changes in the law. In many ways, legal changes simply reflected a larger cultural upheaval. However, the inability of our legal and political system to contain the force of individual rights ideas injected into family law has allowed many cultural dikes to break that in better days might have held. Can anything be done to reverse this tide? I don't know. But if anyone can answer that question, it might be those who understand the prophecies that unless the hearts of the parents and the hearts of the children turn toward one another, the earth will be smitten with a curse. Are we already living in the time of that curse? On some days, I think we might be. But even if we are, the gospel's principles provide the long-term remedy. Years ago, I was on a family law panel at a big Eastern law school, and somebody came up to me and said, Aren't you from BYU, the Mormons? You're the people who still believe in marriage. Will you please help the rest of us? Well, to be clear, I'm not asking to return to the family laws of yesteryear. Many of those laws needed reforms. But I believe we could have done that without resorting to the individualistic extremes that have inflicted so much damage on both children and society. And how do we explain to our children and grandchildren why traditional marriage must be preserved and even revered as we feel the earth moving under our feet and the mainstream threatens to leave the banks of its riverbed? Well, I hope this brief look at legal history might whet your appetite to think more deeply about such family-related questions. And for the sake of our own families, our friends, our own marriages, brothers and sisters, I hope this historical concept will help explain why today's culture no longer understands marriage in the way God intended it. Building a good marriage isn't easy. It isn't supposed to be easy. But when a confused culture confuses you and me about what marriage means, we may give up on ourselves and on each other much too soon. The gospel's eternal perspective, as taught in the scriptures and in the temple, can help us transcend this modern chaos until our marriages become the most sanctifying and satisfying, even if also the most demanding experiences in our lives. Well, what's all this got to do with the temple? Every time we go to the temple, the ordinances reorient us to the natural order of the universe, including the natural order of marriage. Like the ancient mariner, we look to the heavens to get our bearings, and we do that through the temple. As Hugh Nibley once wrote, quote, The temple is built so as to represent the organizing principles of the universe. It's the school where mortals learn about these things, the knot that ties heaven and earth together. Close quote. So the temple has the power to write God's natural laws of marriage and family life into our hearts. Now we first learn the temple's teachings about marriage in the story of Adam and Eve, the primal story of the temple. Years ago, a friend said to me in a conversation, 
If Christ is at the center of the gospel and the temple, why doesn't the temple endowment teach the story of Christ's life? What's all this about Adam and Eve? As I've thought about his question, I've come to believe that the life of Christ is the story of giving the atonement. The story of Adam and Eve is the story of receiving the atonement because they were the first people to receive it amid the sometimes formidable oppositions of mortality. I'd like to invite my wife, Marie, to share something about Eve's perspective on that opposition. Adam and Eve were the first people to receive the Atonement. They were also the first people to hear the cry of a newborn baby, the first to know the soul-stretching sacrifices of raising a child, and also the agony of watching children unwisely use their agency. What I have to share tonight will feel like an abrupt change in tone, but this poem by Arta Romney Balaf, a sister, by the way, of President Marion G. Romney, takes us into the heart of marriage and family as it began on this earth. Take a deep breath and come with me into Eve's world as she sees it. The poem is called Lamentation. And God said, Be fruitful and multiply, 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 echoes, multiply. God said, I will greatly multiply thy sorrow, thy sorrow, sorrow, sorrow. I have gotten a man from the Lord. I have traded the fruit of the garden for the fruit of my body, for a laughing bundle of humanity. And now another one who looks like Adam. We shall call this one. Abel. It is a lovely name, Abel. Cain, Abel, the world is yours. God set the sun in the heavens to light your days, to warm the flocks, to kernel the grain. He illuminated your nights with stars. He made the trees and the fruit thereof yielding seed. He made every living thing, the wheat, the sheep, the cattle, for your enjoyment. And behold, it is very good. Adam, Adam, where art thou? Where are the boys? The sky darkens with clouds. Adam, is that you? Where is Abel? He's long caring for the flocks. The sky is black and the rain hammers. Are the ewes lambing in this storm? Why your troubled face, Adam? Are you ill? Why so pale, so agitated? The wind will pass, the lambs will birth with Abel's help. Dead? What is dead? Merciful God, hurry, bring warm water. I'll bathe his wounds, bring clean clothes, bring herbs. I'll heal him. I am trying to understand. You said Abel is dead, but I am skilled with herbs. Remember when he was seven, the fever? Remember how herbs will not heal? Dead? But Cain, where is Cain? Listen to that thunder. Cain? Cursed? But what has happened to him? God said, a fugitive and a vagabond? But how can God do that? They are my sons, too. I gave them birth in the valley of pain. Adam tried to understand. In the valley of pain, I bore them. Fugitive? Vagabond? This is his home. This the soil he loved, where he toiled for golden wheat, for tasseled corn. To the hill country. There are rocks in the hill country. Cain can't work in the hill country. The nights are cold cold and lonely, and the wind gales. Quick, we must find him, a basket of bread in his coat. I worry think of, thinking of him wandering with no place to lay his head. Cain, cursed, a wanderer and a roamer, who will bake his bread and mend his coat? Abel, 
my son, dead. And Cain, my son, a fugitive. Two sons, Adam. We had two sons. Both. Oh, Adam, multiply sorrow. Dear God, why? Tell me again about the fruit. Why? Please tell me again. Why? Eve, Mother Eve, your sorrow and your faithful questions bring a hush across my heart. Father Lehi gives us the doctrinal context for understanding Eve's experience. He tells us that if Adam and Eve had not eaten from the tree of knowledge, they would have remained in the Garden of Eden and they would have had no children. Wherefore, they would have remained in a state of innocence, having no joy, for they knew no misery. I realize that experienced parents will see a little connection here. No children, no misery. <laughs> and further, doing no good, for they knew no sin. Adam fell that men might be mortal, and men are mortal that they might have joy. So. Paradoxically, sin, misery, and children create the context for learning what joy means, a process made possible by the Atonement of Jesus Christ. Because of that Atonement, we can learn from our experience without being condemned by it. And receiving the Atonement, as Adam and Eve did, is not just a doctrine about erasing black marks. It is the core doctrine that allows human development. That is why Adam and Eve do not return to the garden after they are forgiven. Rather, they hold on to each other and they move forward together into the world where we now live. And here they keep growing together as a couple. The temple's primal story is quite consciously the story of a married couple who help one another and face continuous mortal opposition as Adam and Eve did, because only in that sometimes miserable opposition can they learn to comprehend true joy. Now consider two implications from the Adam and Eve story about our understanding of marriage. First is the Restoration's positive view about the fall. We know that Adam and Eve chose wisely in the garden because only mortality could provide the experience needed to fulfill God's plan for them and for us. In contrast, traditional Christianity teaches that Eve's choice was a tragic, some would say stupid, mistake, bringing down the wrath of God on all mankind. Some Christian churches still teach that because women are the daughters of foolish Eve, wives should be dependent on their husbands. Reacting strongly against this idea, most people today would say wives should be independent of their husbands, and in fairness they would add husbands should be independent of their wives. So when both spouses are independent of each other, we get today's non-binding commitments and people leave when the fun stops. So which is correct, dependence or independence? Neither one. The restored gospel, unlike the rest of Christianity, teaches that Eve and Adam's choice in the garden wasn't a mistake at all. It was actually a heroic choice. So the Restoration sees Eve and all women as noble beings who are the complete equals of men. Eve is not dependent on Adam, nor is she independent from him. Rather, Eve and Adam are interdependent with each other. As the Family Proclamation teaches, they are equal partners who help one another in everything they do. We find a second significant implication for marriage in a later scene from the Adam and Eve story. When they left the garden, the Lord directed them to build an altar and offer animal sacrifices. 
After many days, an angel asked Adam why he offered sacrifices. He said, I know not, save the Lord commanded me. The angel told him, This thing is a similitude of the, only, of, the, of the sacrifice of the only begotten. The lambs they sacrificed symbolize the Father's future redemptive sacrifice of His Son. The angel then taught Adam and Eve that Christ's sacrifice and the plan of redemption gave meaning and purpose to all of their opposition, from leaving Eden to Eve's lamentation over her sons. Many of us go to the temple today the way Adam and Eve did at first, simply because we're commanded without really knowing why. And simple obedience is certainly better than not performing the ordinances at all. But the Lord who sent that angel must have wanted Adam and Eve to know why they sacrificed. And I believe He wants us to know why we perform our ordinances. Are today's temple ordinances also a similitude of the only begotten? Think of how the temple's altars are like the altar of Adam and Eve, altars of prayer and sacrifice and covenant. Think of the dimensions of sacrifice in all the covenants of the endowment. Since Christ completed His atoning mission, we no longer offer animal sacrifice, but we do covenant to sacrifice. In what way? Christ taught the Nephites, You shall offer for a sacrifice unto me a broken heart and a contrite spirit. Animal sacrifice symbolized the Father's sacrifice of the Son. But the sacrifice of a broken heart and a contrite spirit symbolizes the Son's sacrifice of Himself. James E. Talmage wrote that Jesus died of a broken heart. In similitude, we now offer ourselves as a personal sacrifice. As Elder Neil A. Maxwell once said, quote, Real personal sacrifice never was placing an animal on the altar. Instead, it is a willingness to put the animal in us on the altar and letting it be consumed. Close quote. With these ideas on my mind, some months ago I was about to seal a young couple in the St. George Temple as I invited them to come to the altar. He took her by the hand, and I realized that they were about to place upon that altar of sacrifice their own broken hearts and contrite spirits, a selfless offering of themselves to each other and to God in emulation of Christ's sacrifice for them. And for what purpose? so that through a lifetime of sacrificing for each other, that is, living as He did, they might become ever more as He is. By trying to live that way every day, they would each come closer to God, which would also bring them closer to each other. And so living the covenants of the sealing ordinance would sanctify not only their marriages but their hearts and their very lives. Brothers and sisters, this understanding of marriage differs starkly and powerfully from the prevailing view in today's culture. In His parable of the Good Shepherd, Jesus described a hireling, someone who is paid to care for the sheep. When the wolf comes, He said, the hireling leaveth the sheep and fleeth. Why does the hireling run away? Because, Jesus said, his own the sheep are not. By contrast, he said of himself, I am the Good Shepherd. I lay down my life for the sheep. Most people today now think of marriage as an informal arrangement between two hirelings. And when a hireling feels threatened by some wolf of trouble, he'll simply flee. If trouble is coming, why should he risk his comfort or convenience, let alone his life? But when we offer in our marriage a broken heart and a contrite spirit in similitude of the Good Shepherd, we will give our lives for the sheep of our covenant, even a day or even an hour at a time. That process invites us to take selflessly upon ourselves both the afflictions and the joys of our companion, emulating in our own limited ways how the Savior takes upon Himself our afflictions. Be you afflicted in all his afflictions, said the Lord to Peter Whitmer about his missionary companion Oliver Cowdery. Isaiah echoed that phrase in describing Christ and those he redeems. 
in all their afflictions. He was afflicted, and he carried them all the days of old. Not long ago, I asked some temple workers what they think it would, what they thought it would mean to live the life of a broken heart and a contrite spirit in a marriage. That is to treat one's spouse as Christ Himself would treat us. Let me give you some of their answers. One of them said, "It means choosing to be kind all the time." Another said, "Trying to care about someone else's needs more than you do your own." And another, "I'll offer not only my heart." but also my arms and my hands. And finally, it's the sacrifice of learning to give up the natural man within me. Another temple worker lost his wife after she had suffered a debilitating illness for several years. After her funeral, he said to me, I thought I knew what love was. We'd had over 50 blessed years together. But only in trying to care for her in these last few years did I discover what love is. By going where he had to go, being afflicted in her afflictions, this man discovered wellsprings of compassion deep in his own heart that a hireling will never know exists. And the accumulation of such discoveries produces the sanctifying process of becoming like the Good Shepherd by living and giving as he does, and not incidentally. That kind of living breathes irreplaceable strength into the social interests. Before we conclude, I'd like to respond to the question a friend asked recently. How close to perfection do you have to live to receive the exalted promises of a temple ceiling? Husbands and wives know each other so well, especially those who seek for eternal blessings. On some days, we can honestly wonder if we're living close enough to perfection or maybe if our spouse is. Whichever one of us we wonder about, it can be a hard question. I like the answer given in Moroni's farewell words. If ye shall, number one, deny yourselves of all ungodliness, and number two, love God with all your might, mind, and strength, then is His grace sufficient for you, that ye may be perfected in Christ. One way to rid ourselves of ungodliness is to stay close to the temple, because in its ordinances the power of godliness is manifest. Further, Moroni invites us to love God with all your might. That means loving to the extent of our own unique capacity, not to the extent of some abstract and unreachable scale of perfection. As we deny ourselves of ungodliness and honestly love God as fully as we are able to love, then Christ's atoning grace can fill in the gaps to make us whole. I recently ran across a letter I would never heard of before. It was about marriage, written by the First Presidency in 1902. It suggests what this combination of Christ's total sacrifice and our own total sacrifice will look like. After reaching the perfected state of life, people will have no other desire than to live in harmony with righteousness, including that which united them as husband and wife. Those who attain the first or celestial resurrection must necessarily be pure and holy, and they will be perfect in body as well. Every man and woman that reaches this unspeakable condition of life will be as beautiful as the angels that surround the throne of God, for the weakness of the flesh will then have been overcome and forgotten, and both husband and wife will be in harmony with the laws that united them." I know a woman who was married about 50 years ago in the temple. After she and her husband had had several children, His turbulent life led both to his divorce, their divorce, and his excommunication. Then she gave up her own Church membership and chose some thorny paths. Later on, he passed away. I met her when her 45-year-old daughter brought her to my office in the temple to explore whether the mother could ever return to the temple, something that mother was quite convinced could never happen. After a mellow, peaceful conversation about learning from experience without being condemned by it, we discussed the processes of repentance and rebaptism and the restoration of temple blessings. Then I said the restoration ordinance would also restore her temple ceiling. Was she ready for that? 
After a pause, the daughter spoke first. She said, I have bipolar disorder. My son is bipolar. We know a lot more about that disorder than we used to, and we take medications that help. Looking back, I think my father was bipolar, and that influenced so many of the hard things in our family's life. I don't judge him anymore. Soon her mother said softly, If I really can return to the temple someday, I will be ready for my ceiling to be restored. As I watched those two women walk down the hall, I realized that the temple and Elijah's ceiling power are sources of reconciliation, turning not only the hearts of children to their fathers and mothers, but turning the hearts of wives and husbands toward each other. Brothers and sisters, I bear witness that the order of marriage that God gave to Adam and Eve is worth whatever it takes to find it, to build it, and to keep it. I also testify that husbands and wives who try to live like the Good Shepherd will discover and will give to each other the abundant life of authentic joy. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. Our kind and gracious Heavenly Father, we come to Thee at this time to thank Thee for the wonderful opportunity that we have to get together as a law society, as law students, as attorneys, as legal professionals, that we may be able to find ways to better serve those in our community and learn ways to become better, better examples, better individuals, and that we might be able to learn more from thy example and, the, and Jesus Christ's example as well. We are thankful for the example of Scott Cameron and Elder and Sister Hafen. We ask thee to help us remember the messages shared today, that we are able to keep those principles and stories close to our hearts and minds and that we are able to keep finding ways to be stronger. We come to Thee at this time to ask Thee to bless all of us in this society, that we are able to take full advantage of all the opportunities that the J. Reuben Clark Law Society offers us as students and as attorneys. We are thankful for the gospel of Thy Son we are thankful for the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. We are thankful for our membership of the Church and for all of those around us that bless our lives. We are thankful for the Atonement of Jesus Christ, for His suffering and all the pain He endured. And we ask Thee to help us be worthy of Thy love. We are thankful for everything, and we ask Thee to bless all the members of the J. Reuben Clark Law Society around the world that are watching this fireside, that they are able to learn and be wonderful examples as well. And we say these things in the name of thy Son, Jesus Christ. Amen.